Hello everyone! Welcome back to The Reading Corner. Thank you so much for choosing to be here. I hope that you're all well wherever you are and you're all still staying safe. This week on The Reading Corner we've been making our way firmly through Mary Poppins by P.L. Travers and today being the last day of the week means that we have finally reached chapter seven, the final chapter in the book. Well done for sticking with it so far. It's such a big book and this is a really big achievement on your part. So well done. Are you all ready? Then let's begin. It was the first day of spring. Jane and Michael knew this at once because they heard Mr. Banks singing in his bath and there was only one day in the year when he did that. They always remembered that particular morning. For one thing, it was the first time they were allowed to come downstairs for breakfast and for another, Mr. Banks lost his black bag. So that the day began with two extraordinary happenings. Where is my bag? shouted Mr. Banks turning round and round in the hall, like a dog chasing its tail. And everybody else began running round and round too. Ellen and Mrs Brill and the children. Even Robertson A made a special effort and turned round twice. At last, Mr Banks discovered the bag himself in the study. And he rushed into the hall with it, holding it aloft. Now, he said, as though he were delivering a sermon. My bag is always kept in one place. Here, on the umbrella stand. Who put it in the study? He roared. You did, my dear, when you took the income tax papers out of it last night, said Mrs Banks. Humph, rumph, he said, blowing his nose very hard and taking his overcoat from its peg. He walked with it to the front door. Hello, he said more cheerfully. The parrot tulips are in bud. He went into the garden and sniffed the air. Hmm, winds in the west, I think. He looked downwards towards Admiral Bim's house, where the telescope weathercock swung. I thought so, he said. Westerly weather, bright and balmy. I won't take an overcoat. And with that, he picked up his bag and his bowler hat and hurried away to the city. Did you hear what he said? Michael grabbed Jane's arm. She nodded. The winds in the west she said very slowly. Neither of them said any more, but there was a thought in each of their minds that they wished was not there. They forgot it soon, however, for everything seemed to be as it always was, and the spring sunlight lit up the house so beautifully that nobody remembered it needed a coat of paint and new wallpapers. On the contrary, they all found themselves thinking that it was the best house in Cherry Tree Lane. But trouble began after luncheon. Jane had gone down to dig in the garden with Robertson A. She had just sown a row of radish seed when she heard a commotion in the nursery and the sound of hurrying footsteps on the stairs. Presently, Michael appeared, very red in the face and panting loudly. Look, Jane, look, he cried and held out his hand. Within it lay Mary Poppin's compass, with the disc frantically swinging round the arrow as it trembled in Michael's shaking hand. The compass, said Jane, and looked at him questioningly. Michael suddenly burst into tears. She gave it to me, he wept. She said I could have it all for myself now. 
Oh, oh, there must be something wrong. What's going to happen? She's never given me anything before. Perhaps she was only being nice, said Jane, to soothe him. But in her heart, she felt as disturbed as Michael was. She knew very well that Mary Poppins never wasted time in being nice. And yet, strange to say, during that afternoon, Mary Poppins never said a cross word. Indeed, she hardly said a word at all. She seemed to be thinking very deeply. And when they asked questions, she answered them in a faraway voice. At last, Michael could bear it no longer. Oh, do be cross, Mary Poppins. Do be cross again. It's not like you. Oh, I feel so anxious. And indeed, his heart felt heavy with the thought that something, he did not know quite what, was about to happen at number 17, Cherry Tree Lane. Trouble, trouble, and it will trouble you, retorted Mary Poppins crossly in her usual voice. And immediately... He felt a little better. Perhaps it's only a feeling, he said to Jane. Perhaps everything is all right and I'm just imagining. Don't you think so, Jane? Probably, said Jane slowly. But she was thinking hard and her heart felt tight in her body. The wind grew wilder towards evening and blew in little gusts about the house. It went pulling and whistling down the chimneys, slipping through the cracks under the windows, turning the nursery carpet up at the corners. Mary Poppins gave them their supper and cleared away the things, stacking them neatly and methodically. Then she tidied up the nursery and put the kettle on the hob. There, she said glancing around the room to see that everything was all right. She was silent for a minute. Then she put one hand lightly on Michael's head and the other on Jane's shoulder. Now, she said, I am just going to take the shoes down for Robert's and A to clean. Behave yourselves, please, till I come back. She went out and shut the door quietly behind her. Suddenly, as she went, they both felt that they must run after her, but something seemed to stop them. They remained quiet, with their elbows on the table, waiting for her to come back. Each was trying to reassure the other without saying anything. How silly we are, Jane said presently. Everything's all right. But she knew she said it more to comfort Michael than because she thought it was true. The nursery clock ticked loudly from the mantelpiece. The fire flickled and crackled slowly and died down. They still sat there at the table, waiting. At last, Michael said uneasily, She's been gone a very long time, hasn't she? The wind whistled and cried about the house as if in reply. The clock went on ticking its solemn double note. Suddenly, the silence was broken by the sound of the front door shutting with a loud bang. Michael, said Jane, starting up. Jane, said Michael, with a white, anxious look on his face. They listened. Then they ran quickly to the window and looked out. Down below... Just outside the front door stood Mary Poppins, dressed in her coat and hat, with her carpet bag in one hand and her umbrella in the other. The wind was blowing wildly about her, tugging at her skirt, tilting her hat rakishly to one side. But it seemed to Jane and Michael that she did not mind, for she smiled as though she and the wind understood each other. She paused for a moment on the step and glanced back toward the front door. Then, with a quick movement, she opened the umbrella, though it wasn't raining, and thrust it over her head. The wind, with a wild cry, slipped under the umbrella 
pressing it upwards as though trying to force it out of Mary Poppins' hand. But she held on tightly. And that, apparently, was what the wind wanted her to do. For presently, it lifted the umbrella higher into the air and Mary Poppins from the ground. It carried her so lightly so that her toes just grazed along the garden path. Then it lifted her over the front gate and swept her upwards towards the branches of the cherry trees in the lane. She's going, Jane! She's going! cried Michael, weeping. Quick! cried Jane. Let us get the twins. They must see the last of her. She had no doubt now, nor Michael, that Mary Poppins had gone for good because the wind had changed. They each seized a twin and rushed back to the window. Mary Poppins was in the upper air now, floating away over the cherry trees and the roofs of houses, holding tightly to the umbrella with one hand and to the carpet bag with the other. The twins began to cry quietly. With their free hands, Jane and Michael opened the window and made one last effort to stay Mary Poppins' flight. Mary Poppins, they cried. Mary Poppins, come back! But she either did not hear or deliberately took no notice. For she went sailing on and on, up into the cloudy, whistling air, till at last she was wafted away over the hill and the children could see nothing but the trees bending and moaning under the wild west wind. She did what she said she would anyway. She stayed till the wind changed, said Jane sighing and turn, turning sadly from the window. She took John to his cot and put him into it. Michael said nothing, but as he brought Barbara back and tucked her into bed, he was sniffing uncomfortably. I wonder, said Jane, if we'll ever see her again. Suddenly they heard voices on the stairs. Children! Children! Mrs. Banks was calling as she opened the door. Children, I am very cross. Mary Poppins has left us. Yes, said Jane and Michael. You knew then, said Mrs. Banks, rather surprised. Did she tell you she was going? They shook their heads and Mrs. Banks went on. It's outrageous. One minute here and gone the next. Not even an apology simply said, I'm going, and off she went. Anything more preposterous, more thoughtless, more discourteous. What is it, Michael? She broke off crossly, for Michael had grasped her skirt in his hands and was shaking her. What is it, child? Did she say she'd come back, he cried, nearly knocking his mother over. Tell me, did she? Jane burst into tears. Mary Poppins is the only person I want in the world, Michael wailed, and flung himself onto the floor. Really, children, really, I don't understand you. Do be good, I beg of you. There's nobody to look after you tonight. I have to go out to dinner, and it's Ellen's day off. I shall have to send Mrs Brill up. And she kissed them absent-mindedly, and went away with an anxious little line on her forehead. Well, if I ever did, her going away and leaving you poor dear children in the lurch like that, said Mrs Brill a moment later, bustling in and setting to work on them. A heart of stone, that's what that girl had, and no mistake or my name's not Clara Brill. Always keeping herself to herself too, not even a lace handkerchief or a hat pin to remember her by. Get up, will you please, Master Michael? Mrs Brill went on, panting heavily. How we stood her so long, I don't know, with her, her airs and graces and all. What a lot of buttons, Miss Jane. Stand still, do now, and let me undress you, Master Michael. 
Plain she was too, nothing much to look at. Indeed, all things considered, I don't know that we won't be better off after all. My Miss Jane, where's your nightgown? Why, what's this under your pillow? Mrs Brill had drawn out a small, knobbly parcel. What is it? Give it to me, give it, said Jane, trembling with excitement. And she took it from Mrs Brill's hands very quickly. Michael came and stood near her and watched her undo the string and tear away the brown paper. Mrs Brill, without waiting to see what emerged from the package, went in to the twins. The last wrapping fell to the floor and the thing that was in the parcel lay in Jane's hand. It's her picture, she said in a whisper, looking closely at it. And it was. Inside the little curly frame was a painting of Mary Poppins and underneath it was written Mary Poppins by Bert. That's the match man. He did it, said Michael and took it in his hand so that he could have a better look. Jane found suddenly that there was a letter attached to the painting. She unfolded it carefully. It ran Dear Jane, Michael had the compass, so the picture is for you. Au revoir, Mary Poppins. She read it out loud till she came to the words she couldn't understand. Mrs Brill, she called. What does au revoir mean? Au revoir, dearie, shrieked Mrs Brill from the next room. Why doesn't it mean... Ah, oh, let me see, I'm not up in these foreign tongues... Doesn't it mean God bless you? No, no, I'm wrong. I think, Miss Jane dear, it means to meet again. Jane and Michael looked at each other. Joy and understanding shone in their eyes. They knew what Mary Poppins meant. Michael gave a long sigh of relief. Oh, that's all right, he said shakily. She always does what she says she will. He turned away. Michael, are you crying? Jane asked. He twisted his head and tried to smile at her. No, I am not, he said. It's only my eyes. She pushed him gently towards his bed. And as he got in, she slipped the portrait of Mary Poppins into his hand hurriedly, in case she should regret it. You have it for tonight, darling, whispered Jane, and she tucked him in, just as Mary Poppins used to do. The End